And Jennifer, could you go to the, the next slide? Awesome, thank you. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Sarah Husky with 3C Wren. I've started recording this course, which will be provided uh, to you all with a follow-up email as, long, uh, as well as the slides. Um, before we get going, I just have a, a couple of intro slides to run through. Uh, so today's course, the Introduction to the Energy Code, kicks off a six-part series developed for the Central Coast and Ventura ICC chapters. There are registration links for the remaining courses at the end of the presentation, and I'll also add a link to the chat. Um, we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point, but we just ask that everyone make sure they're on mute throughout the duration of today's course. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions in, in the chat box and uh, verbally participate by just raising your hand if you have any questions. Uh, so a little bit about us. We are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Wren. Uh, we are a collaborative partnership between the counties of San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties working to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals. Uh, the first program um, through 3C Rent is the Energy Code Connect program, which serves building professionals by offering Title 24 support for everyone from plans examiners and inspectors to architects and contractors. We have our Energy Code Coach service, which is an over the phone online and in the field support for Title 24 questions for both residential and non-residential projects. Uh, we also have our building performance training program, which serves building professionals by offering technical and soft skill trainings relating to building science principles, high performance buildings, marketing and communication techniques. And then we have our home energy savings program, which incentivizes contractors, and helps residents save money and make their homes healthier with energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. Uh, you may see a few 3C Wren staff members on the training today. If you do and see anyone with this background, feel free to chat with them directly if you have any questions. And with that, I'll pass things over to Andy and Jennifer. Great. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. We're really excited about this uh, series uh, that we um, there was requests specifically from the ICC chapters to um, to talk about the energy code. And so the remaining five sessions, the next four will be really focused on a deep dive in each of the code sections. Then there's a Cal Green section. But this one is really a course overview for the energy code overall. So if you live and breathe the energy code, some of this will be um, very familiar. And uh, But otherwise, we feel like it's an opportunity to get us all on the same foundation. And again, these are all recorded. So if you have folks um, joining your teams that you want to make sure that they understand the context for the, for the code. So today, we're going to go over that historic context that led to the energy code, um, talk a little bit about that cycle, the triennial cycle, of which we are just recently um, now into the 2022 code cycle. Uh, and a little bit about the process um, uh, within design and construction. We do talk to a lot of architects, uh, engineers, and builders, as well as um, jurisdictions. So to be able to have an integrated approach, uh, then uh, more into the specifics of the code itself and a, a fair amount of additional resources so that, uh, so that you can point to get pointed to some um, some tools and information. Uh, we'll also have the uh, upcoming event. So we say questions at the end. Um, I'm happy to also address them as you go. So type them into the chat. We'll continue to uh, monitor those and uh, interrupt. And again, there's you know 24-ish people on the on the line. So small enough group that if you really have something going on, you know, raise your hand, you can unmute and, and have a conversation. So want to make sure that this time is um, most useful for you. All right. So historic context. 
So um, in the 1970s, we um, there was an oil crisis, right? So prior to the 70s that we had a building code, but it was really focused on fire life safety. Uh, but it wasn't until the 70s and the um, OPEC oil embargo, I'm sure some of you remember that, long lines at the uh, gas pump and, um, and really expensive. And so there was a shift in attitude in, um, in what we were trying to do, whether it's drive more slowly to uh, conserve fuel or being able to think more clearly about um, hot water, or even as Jimmy Carter famously said, um, wear a sweater uh, instead of turning up the heat. And then he put on solar panels on the roof of the White House, uh, which then Ronald Reagan promptly removed um, when he came into the office, side point. So within that context in the 70s, then there was um, the CEC, California Energy Commission was established and then working with the Building Standards Commission adopted the energy code. This graph to the right um, is kind of our California brag graph uh, in that it is showing how the blue line is the energy use for the rest of the country and showing that increasing um, uh, energy use, whereas with California, despite a dramatic increase in population over those years, that our energy use was flat. So our per capita really um, continued to drop. And so, um, and, and it's been working. So, uh, so we have these efficiency standards, right? And they're layered on top of the rest of our building and construction standards. It's a very complex um, uh, issue for our designers and contractors and for our plans examiners and inspectors. Uh, with lots of codes. And I think that there's been a sense of um, uh, a focus on that fire life safety, and then maybe below that is energy efficiency. But bigger context, you know, it's all required. And our goal really is to help make this as painless as possible for our design teams, for our um, uh, plan checkers, uh, for the contractors. Like, let's figure out, one, how to comply and really know what you're getting into, but also how to make it the most useful to have happy clients and um, better performing buildings and meet those goals of reducing wasteful and unnecessary energy consumption. And it's and the, and the code has worked and we've inspired um, states throughout the nation and throughout the world, honestly, to look more closely at their energy performance standards. Uh, we've had a steady progression. So uh, starting in that 1970s, and then uh, as you uh, click through, we've had the California Green Building Code was introduced, some alignment there with LEED, the U.S. Green Building Council built building certification, because it is addressing water and materials resources and site um, issues, et cetera. And then uh, each code cycle is uh, moving towards all electric and renewable energy. Um, and then the current code cycle moving towards um, re reduction in greenhouse gas uh, emissions and moving towards that carbon-free electric generation. And so the current situation is really, and you'll see this theme throughout the entire series of moving toward electrification. So we're moving away from fossil fuels. We know that the carbon emissions from fossil fuels is contributing to climate change. Climate change is hugely impactful um, uh, in, in many ways, uh, quality of life, uh, expense, um, life in general, uh, so that we are, as a state, necessarily moving towards that direction. Uh, this graph on the, this image on the right is really talking about the efficiency that goes along with that electrification, moving away from both gas as well as electric resistant kind of um, devices towards heat pumps as kind of as a means of efficiency. Uh, as you um, may recall that the energy code is required to be cost effective. So as we develop those tests for um, the, in that cycle of um, energy requirements is that we, that the energy commission is, it, their code development is required to show that over the life of those build, the building, those requirements will pay for themselves. So that efficiency makes a big difference in terms of the heat pump and just, you know, getting through it, right? So more than 50 cities and counties throughout California already require some level of all electric new construction. So there's some challenges in court right now. So we're gonna see how that whole thing plays out. 
Um, but that is the direction that we're going. And so into the energy code itself, turn that over to uh, Jennifer. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, the energy code, what we call the energy code, is just one portion of the building standards code, Title 24. And so California has 28 titles, so 28 groupings of laws, standards, uh and um ordinances that as a state everyone uh, follows and there are three in particular that relate to buildings and energy and that's title 20 for the public utilities and energy and how california maintains its energy structure and gets its energy and title 24, which is often what we say short for the energy code, although Title 24 is actually the whole building standards code. So it includes everything about our buildings. And then Title 25, housing and community development, that's where you would find um, resources or ordinances pertaining to typically mobile homes. It does address manufactured homes, like homes that are made in a factory that go on a permanent foundation. And that is uh, keyed back into what you have to follow for Title 24 Energy Code, even though it's also addressed under Title 25, Housing and Community Development. So that kind of gives you overall arching picture of where the energy code kind of fits into all the California code of regulations. And within these titles, um, you can, uh, if you're not familiar with this website, and again, this class is assumed to be an intro to the energy code. So uh, this may be a review for, for some folks, that's fine. As Andy said, do a crossword puzzle or something. <laughs> the interesting part comes up but if you're new to the code um through westlaw website california has uh worked this uh, uh, agreement out with westlaw where all of the california code of regulations and building standards can be found and if you go to that website you'll get a list of all the titles and for example if you click on title 24 it's gonna take you to the CEC's website or the California Department of General Services Building Standards Commission, also um, in conjunction with the California Energy Commission. And from there, that's where you'll find the energy code itself. And you can link from there to the code cycle that you're interested in. Uh, you're going to get a copy of the slides, by the way, um, so you don't have to worry if this is new to you to take notes on everything. Uh, once we get to the California Title 24 building standards, or rather, I mean, yes, Title 24 building standards, that also includes the building code, residential code, electrical code, mechanical code, plumbing code, but part six is specifically for the energy code. When it comes to what we what California addresses under the energy code, there is references back to part four mechanical code or part three electric code. When it comes to photovoltaics, uh, panels that we put on our roof to generate electricity, a lot of times it's gonna refer us back to part nine, which would be the California fire code. And then uh, there's a lot of um, coordination, kind of overlapping goals, but different aspects, which is gonna be hit on part 11, the California Green Building Code Standards. So this just gives you a, a little bit of a look of how this website plays out. 
and the links that you can take. Now, when you go to this portion of the website, you can also link to the ICC. And the ICC's website is going to give you a slightly different version of, I mean, same code, same code language, just the formatting is a little bit different. Um, when you click on this, it's going to take you to the ICC. And part six, energy code, Title 24 with errata, now new on this website is a digital version of the energy code. And personally, I'm used to using a digital version of the energy code. I used to use paper only. Now I've last few years uh, have switched over to the digital code. And what's kind of nice about the ICC's digital version is if you have the money or if your department's paying for it, you can get the premium version which would allow you to share links. Um, it's searchable. You can highlight it. You can take notes. And they're trying to make it a lot more useful to you as someone who's in the planning and building departments or maybe doing uh, uh, code enforcement. So um, that digital version is new. If you're used to seeing the rest of Title 24, which includes all the building code, electric code, plumbing code, if you're used to seeing it in, in their two-column format in a printed version, you can also still order the printed version and either have it delivered to you as like a loose leaf item that you can put in a binder, or you can get that version as a PDF and all those are also for sale, but you'll have to look in the website a little more to find those because it's um, it's not really obvious. The, the landing page gives you the digital version. This, I mention it because Andy and I both had experience where we've tried to show uh, folks a portion of Cal Green uh, part 11 code or part six, the energy code. And when working with our, um, plans examiners, they want to see it in the same format that they're used to seeing in that two column format. And um, it's it's available, but I, I think everyone's starting to make the switch to the digital version. Andy might have something to add about that, but. Um, well, I think it's just a, you know, kind of another artifact of COVID in some ways that we're working from home and we, you know, those shared physical resources were just, you know, not available. So I think it kind of uh, pushed, accelerated the the move towards a, a digital and then the errata right there. And I, I do think that it's easier. I, it's still a, an adjustment for me, but getting there. <laughs> Okay, um, on the California Energy Commission side of things, the California, uh, Andy mentioned in the history of that briefly, that the California Energy Commission was created to handle the energy code. And part of that was coming up with standards for how can we tell if a building is actually gonna meet some basic energy efficiency? And there's a couple of ways they came up with doing it, but it turns out it's just was a little more complex than coming up with a list of things that you had to do, like we typically see in the electric code or the plumbing code or the building code, uh, the, just the, the residential part of the building code. And so the California Energy Commission was put in charge of coming up with these codes and regulations that they, one, had to prove was cost effective, and two, was actually moving um, the country, or the state rather, towards reduction in actual energy use and reduction in the need for building power plants. And so California was successful in that. And then part of this is that every three years, we go through a cycle to 
um, find out or to establish what the new code is going to be. So for example, we in January 1st, 2023, we just adopted the 2022 standards or rather they became effective so now every building that is applied for building permit in california hence january 1st 2023 is now going to be part of the 2022 building standards and the energy code however figuring out what was going to be in the 2022 code started way back uh, June 2021, and that process, um, oh, sorry, it, it started before that, and that process was continues through public workshop engagements. There's a period that's called the CEC pre-rulemaking. Then there is the CEC rulemaking sessions, and then the energy standards and the Cal Green, uh, the energy portion of it is adopted, and then the California Standards Commission, CEC, they make that uh, final uh, approvals, and then the code comes into effect. So starting in June 2021, the state has already been working on updating the weather files and the metrics for the code that will come out in 2025. So it's a quite um, elaborate process. So then January 1st, 2026, we'll have our new 2025 energy standards. So if you're interested in knowing what's going to come up in what will be called the 2025 standards, um now's the time to <laughs> now's the time to hear the last little bit of public workshop stakeholder meetings and case studies and then coming up this summer is going to start the CEC pre rulemaking process and the CEC's rulemaking process all the way through June 2024 so for the next year they're going to be figuring out what's going to be coming up for the 2025 code cycle. So there's quite quite a, a process that goes into this for the triennial cycle. And then the result wow. of this, <laughs> the result of this is that we have the actual 2022 standards. We have what's called reference appendices which gives all the detailed information of what is in those standards. There are two um, or multiple manuals so that you can read these manuals as sort of like a guidebook to the energy code. There's one for non-residential and multifamily compliance, and then there's a separate book for single family compliance. And then supporting each of these manuals is the actual um, mathematics essentially that went into deciding how this computer program, the performance method was going to be implemented. And so uh, <laughs> these are six of my favorite books, but I know I'm very um, unique in that department. <laughs> But most of the time, the code book that you're going to see in the ICC, the part you'll see is just this one here, which is the um, the actual like standards and, and codes. But these other uh, five are what support that one book. OK, when it comes to how is the energy code and portions of, of Cal Green that relate to energy, how are those kind of implemented? Where did they show up in the design and construction process? I am going to turn this back over to Andy so she could talk about that. Thanks, Jennifer. So within this context of the energy code and, and uh, some folks just feeling like it's a check the box uh, exercise and, and kind of running into problems, I, we've identified, and I'm sure you have as well, 
in lots of different settings, but that kind of traditional linear approach of the architect and the in, and architect having a design and then kind of having the silos of the engineering team then figure out how to hold the thing up. Um, and then this whole package comes together and goes to a plan checker who may or may not be able to find any of the references or lack of consistency. So there's a whole bunch of back and forth. Then finally, there's a permit, the builder comes on board and you know, then they're trying to piece things together that may or may not be alignment. And then finally an inspector comes on and you know, they're like something big maybe got missed a long time ago. And so they're trying to figure out how to put all the pieces together. So we've really been having a lot of conversations about having an integrated approach um, to design and construction so that um, issues are identified early and we have the architect and the team and the builder working together with a permitting agency and check-ins along the way so that we don't have those expensive surprises um, toward the end of a project. And we're seeing a lot more of those, right? So a design build teams, um, having um, a contractor on board a team early, having those preliminary meetings with the building department, super helpful to be able to have a more integrated approach um, for efficiencies and, and using the codes to its um, best effectiveness. There's also an interesting um, play that comes around in terms of throughout the process, where does the energy code plug in? Where does Cal Green plug in? Um, and so we talk about this circle of accountability at each of these stages and it starts with the owner uh, articulating what it is that they want. It's sometimes in an owner project requirements. Um, it could be a program document, but um, especially the ones that are focused on energy performance. Then it goes to the architect and team. They're figuring out, they might be working with a, hopefully with a contractor, with a um, building departments already at that stage to develop the basis of design. And again, it could incorporate both the energy performance, compliance, uh, um, part 11 for Cal Green, all of those features coming together. Then as it goes into plan review and permitting, one of the main um, uh, um, points of this uh, part is to have the plans and specifications reflect those design decisions. So it doesn't matter if there's a whole bunch of words in that OPR and BOD, it's gotta be in the plan set so that it's that the plan reviewer knows that the, the project is in compliance with those codes. It shifts over to um, construction. And again, with those drawings all approved, uh, it starts to become a fairly straightforward process for the contractor and their subcontractors to be able to install per those design decisions. And then as construction, um, uh, moves towards completion kind of throughout that there's going to be um, that verification performance testing. So inspections along the way, but also at the very end, is it actually getting to the light levels that the owner required? Is it having the controllability of the mechanical systems that the owner required? And so that could be in the form of a commissioning agent for the non-residential or larger multifamily projects. It could be um, a HERS rater, which is a home energy uh, rating system, a special uh, certification for a professional to be able to do um, uh, field verification for envelope leakage, duct leakage, and some other, a lot of other pieces. We'll talk about those more within those subsequent um, uh, uh, sessions in the series. Uh, and then finally wrapping up to be able to get back to the owner with the um, uh, the instructions, the reports that show that the project complies, the operating uh, maintenance manuals, commissioning report, and so confirming um, both the code and the owner requirements. So, uh, so you can see that in in, in kind of the, the approach that we think is most effective, it really is from the concept all the way through to construction back to those original goals, which may have evolved, but we're documenting it along the way. Andy, and would you say, I mean, really the whole purpose of, especially for the commercial projects to have commissioning, to have an OPR owner project requirements, I mean, all of this, and to make sure it was in the plans is to really, it helps the building be a better building, but it also uh, helps all the plans examiners and um, field inspectors, because it is, 
it is a kind of an overwhelming amount of information sometimes, especially when they have to know, you know, you folks would have to know all the other aspects of the code. And then, right. you know, and that's why we had our HERS raters, our home energy rating systems uh, specialists to take on a lot of those kinds of inspections that are really specialized that a, uh, a field inspector really wouldn't be able to do that and everything else in their job. Right, that's right. Thanks, thanks, Jennifer, that's exactly right. So putting all those uh, together. Um, so let's see, we're gonna take a little closer look into Title 24, Part 6. Andy, there's gonna, um, Andy's gonna go run through some of the basic vocabulary and then I'll pick it up again. We're doing a bit of tag team here to help help mix it up for you guys. <laughs> right. So going on, just before I uh, hand it off uh, to Jennifer uh, to be able to dig into more of the specifics, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of these kind of three compliance terms. Honestly, when I was first learning about the energy code, it took me a few tries to um, understand how these apply. So the mandatory requirements are the energy efficiency measures that are uh, applicable to all projects. So that's our baseline, no matter what, uh, those are required. Then we have the prescriptive component package and the mandatory requirements still apply. And then these are the ones that are specific construction um, that are gonna be uh, applicable for that project. And it's like a recipe card. So insulation needs to be this, window areas need to be this, mechanical systems need to hit this and such efficiency um, levels. And so that's this checklist approach. And it's also our baseline. So then for the next um, term as the performance method is that the prescriptive component package, that recipe card ends up being the baseline. But when you go to the performance method, we're doing energy modeling. And within that context, you can trade so if you have more windows than the recipe card allows, you can trade that with um, higher efficiency mechanical equipment or window glazing properties or some other way. So either way, you have to comply with the um, uh, maximum allowable amount of energy per uh, square foot of building for that project type, but it gives you some flexibility. So a little uh, simpler uh, for the prescriptive component package, but it's uh, also not as flexible. So, uh, and then as we did talk about with the um, energy code and that prescriptive package and the modeling is that's very dependent on the climate zones. And so there's a climate zone map um, in terms of where each um, property is located. And so you'll see in terms of that cost effectiveness that we've referred to, is that um, it needs to work for each climate zone. So that way, all of those tables are often going to show all 16 climate zones so that you can see the um, uh, um, that you know, super cold climate is going to have a different requirement cost effectiveness than uh, a milder climate like we have here on the coast. Yeah, that's um, I, yeah. yeah, I saw there was a but, well, I was just going to, I saw that there was a um, a question in the chat, um, knowing so much so early um, imply unlimited budgetary resources in a time of increasing interest rate. And I, it sounds like the question is, is about um, that we're doing a whole bunch of upfront work in order to understand everything about a building and considering the kind of um, uh, tenuous uh, climate for construction right now and financing. Are we over investing up front? Am I am I getting the question? Does that kind of align um, with that? Um, thank you for uh, for answering the question. I think uh, I don't mean to be critical. I, I think what you're saying is is very important that uh, the people plan ahead of time and and think about the whole project from the very beginning. Um, but one thing I've noticed uh, in terms of my work in Mexico and also even in the United States, uh, people may begin with um, certain financial resources and later in the project, they may not have as much. So um, it, it's just kind of saying, oh, okay, well, I, I, are we kind of presuming unlimited resources in 
and the developer and is that realistic? Yeah, I think it's a super fair question. I think that the uh, practicality on the ground is what you're you're getting towards. Um, so, and I think it's really true about um, being able to document to a certain level what the expectations are and then understand uh, perhaps an evolution. We just were working on a project where the um, owner uh, wanted in terms of resiliency, they wanted to be operating their entire building um, for uh, if there was a power outage, they wanted backup power for three full days for all systems, right? And then they found out how much that kind of battery system would cost. And so then they roll back and go, okay, so look, we just need the this part of the building and this refrigeration, et cetera. So I think that there, I think it's a great point that um, uh, that you're just because you're stating one thing doesn't mean you're locked in and and aren't open to a um, an evolution. But I think it goes what we see more of is that later in the project, an owner requirement comes up and they might say like, oh, of course I want operable windows. And then everybody's like, oh my gosh, what? We, you know, we were designing for, you know, this other system that wouldn't work with that and da, 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 da. So I think that having the requirements at least noted up front, but with the flexibility to reflect project reality. I think, yeah, yeah really good point. Yeah, tag on that. It's Part of the reason for like the commercial projects that became a uh, part of that code that we would have a process for larger commercial projects to have owner project requirements and document the basis of design and then how well that's done varies by design team and ownership team um, but big picture for california part of their goals too is that by implementing these energy standards, California was able to avoid the construction of many additional power plants. And so those costs also were considered because just the cost of building multiple power plants, all of that cost would have been pushed back onto all of the taxpayers. And so there was a certain like overall big picture cost effectiveness for California as a whole. But right now in our current situation economically, it's we're still on track for those things, but it does come into play when the California Commission is looking at how the energy is created and where it comes from and what are those resources? And that's kind of baked into the energy performance modeling, which um, is, it's a just, it's a different level of looking at cost effectiveness, but it is a super important one as a state, as a whole population that we move forward. Um, let's see, I, I mean, oh my gosh, that would be super fun to talk about this for a long time, but um, I promise yeah, let's get, let's keep the going. Slide. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so, um, okay. Now within, okay. So we kind of like big picture title 24 part six and part 11. So part six energy code, part 11, Cal green. Um, they fit into this bigger picture of titles, you know, title 24 and there's, 28 titles, right? But now we take a, we're going to just take a look at part six on the energy code and just see how that in and of itself is organized. Reason I mention it is it's not really intuitive. And especially if you end up using the digital version ICC code, they don't have a super great way to show you how it's organized. So I created this graphic visually that um, I think helps a lot of folks understand how that whole code section is organized. So there's subchapter one and subchapter two that's gonna apply to all the occupancies and those applied to a lot of scope, lots of definitions and those mandatory requirements Andy mentioned that goes to everything. Then. And this is under the 2019 code. I'm going to tell you this first because coming the 2022 code that just went into effect in January, they changed it. Okay. 
So I'm going to jump ahead to chapters seven, eight, and nine because that addressed low rise residential projects like low rise multifamily and basically all residential projects. And then chapters three, four, five, and six, that was like everything else that was not residential. Okay, and again, you're gonna get a copy of the slide. So if you're new to the energy code and seeing how it's organized, it's useful to you, you'll have the slide uh, available. Now for the 2022 code, there was a lot of feedback over the years about some of multifamily projects, high rise multifamily was under that non-residential part of the code, but the low rise multifamily was under the low rise residential code. So you're kind of, if you're working on multifamily projects, sometimes you're split between the two different codes. So for Title 24, Part 6, under 2022, we still have chap subchapters 1 and 2 that address everything. But now, for chapters 10, 11, and 12, they've pulled out the multifamily residential projects out of the, the low-rise res part of the code and out of what was considered not residential portion of the code. And so now we have our own section for all of the multifamily residential. And this does address high-rise multifamily residential, low-rise multifamily residential, and it addresses some of the community spaces that are really not residential that are part of those multifamily projects that include like common area spaces and maybe even a, um, and uh, caretaker's office or the maintenance. Um, uh, I'm, I'm missing the word. It's not a caretaker, but the person who runs the place for the organization that has the managers project. Yeah, manager, yeah. right? Site. Manager. Yeah, on site yeah. manager. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, under that non residential part of the code, we still have uh, the hotel motel and everything else that's not residential is under that code. So that's kind of a big structural change. If you're brand new to the code, it might not mean too much to you because you'll just learn this way of it being organized. But if you do ever have a project or you're talking to anyone else who's been doing it and they're referencing back under the old uh, previous codes, then you'll know that you won't have chapters 10 and 11 and 12 to refer to. It'll be embedded within those other chapters uh, three through nine. Um, one thing, one table I think is super useful, and this is true in the digital version uh, from the ICC, which actually this, I excerpt this from the digital version, and then there's a similar version in the paper copy. If you get the paper copy that's out of the CEC, they have in subchapter one, table 100A. This is kind of a useful way to look at how the whole code is organized. So it's by first by those occupancy types and then the application. So by application, it could be the envelope, which means the walls, the roofs, the floor. It could be the HVAC system or lighting or a pool and spa system. So it's by application. Then it gives you a link, it's, but if you get the premium version digital, it, those blue things will link you to those portions of the code that is addressed and just take you straight away to those sections. And if it's part of that prescriptive uh, uh, recipe card or checklist, it'll link you right to those. If you're doing the computer performance method, it'll link you to those. And if it's an addition or an alteration, because um, each of those big topics, not residential, residential and multifamily, they each have their own chapter that addresses specifically additions and alterations, which is very nuanced. And um, we'll, we will go in deeper to each of those things um, in the other classes that we're offering. And this is a continuation which addresses the single family 
and the multifamily portion. And just to give you an example, um, let's say we were going to take a look at a, a requirement for uh, a single family. Let's say we're looking at the envelope conditions and we wanna know more about the walls, the roofs, and what's a mandatory requirement and what's the prescriptive requirement. And then we would connect onto those links and it would take you into that into that section of the code. So I think this table's super handy and it's a great way just to see where you need to go quickly to find things. Um, as an example, for the low rise residential, you know, um, I mentioned that each of these sections, they kind of have their own chapter. So now low rise residential is really just residential and it can be a single family home or a duplex or a town home. And real technically that town home or duplex it, or row house, it can, you could have a single family residence that's five stories tall if you wanted. It's just that typically they're not usually more than three stories. So the low rise is kind of a carryover term. But there's, um, again, there's those mandatory measures that apply to all categories, but let's say specifically we wanted to take a look at wall insulation, then we'd go into section C. And um, if we were looking at the prescriptive method for new construction, we would go to the section that applied to building envelopes. And we could show it as a, a checklist. What if this looks like when you actually go into these tables, like Andy alluded, is that it's all spelled out by climate zone. So up at the very top, and this is just an excerpt to take a look at the wall example, is climate zone nine, um, for example, for the walls that are above grade that's framed, it's gonna tell us what U factor we have to apply to. Now, uh, U factor is akin to an R value. It uh, just tells us how well a building is insulated. So if you're new to the energy code, looking up a U factor is gonna be a little problematic. And what the energy experts will know already are the ones who are doing this for the code and architects are supposed to know is that that particular U factor means something in terms of a wall assembly. And so there is a way to kind of translate these U factors and it's based on thermal heat transfer through a whole wall assembly. So for example, if we have certain wall assemblies, and this information is found in the manual and found in these reference appendices, but it's not in the main code book that you're gonna look at, but it, the information is there. Um, we know that a U factor meeting that requirement on the past table for climate zone nine would be possible with an R21 loose fill insulation within a two by six wall, or it also could be an R23 uh, high density bat or mineral wool within the wall assembly. And all of those would, would work for climate zone nine. It's, if you're brand new to the code, that's maybe a little, um, you know, it's a lot of information, but this, but it's just an example of how the code is broken down into a different components of a building that impacts the energy use. And so that recipe card would dictate what you can do for your walls, what you can do for your windows, what you can do for your roof, your ceiling, your floors, your mechanical system, et cetera. And for a commercial project, for example, um, climate zone five, it's a milder climate zone, but there's going to be certain requirements for your walls, your floors, your roofs, and those also are mostly spelled out by U factors. 
but there's going to be some sort of translation. So you're going to, in other words, you're going to take a look at those code books and let's say we're going to have a wall assembly and we want to compare what do we need to do for a wood frame wall or what do we want to do for a metal framed wall. And if you have a two by four wood frame wall, you only need an R13 insulation in the wall. But if you're going to use a metal stud wall, you would need a two by six metal stud with R19 in the walls plus an R12 worth of continuous insulation on the exterior of those walls to prevent thermal bridging. So it makes kind of a big difference. And if you're in a different climate zone, like four, nine, or 16, the requirement is slightly different and you only need like an R2, which is just like an inch thick of insulation um, or, or less on the outside of the wall. And then if you're in a really mild climate zone, like six or seven, which you have down in um, Ventura, right on the coast, you don't, you don't need to worry about exterior continuous insulation, for example. So the energy code is very specific per the climate zone. And when you do follow that per, uh, prescriptive method, you're gonna follow that recipe card on everything. And if you can't just have that building follow everything on the checklist, then you go to the performance method, which is a computer program that takes into account where the building's located in terms of climate zone, how it's oriented. So it takes into account the effects of solar heat gain on the walls and through the windows of the building. It takes into account the orientation of those walls and all of the windows. And it takes into account when that energy is being used, which is something called time dependent valuation of the energy. And that in and of itself takes into account how the energy was made and where it came from. And there's also a new metric. If you're a little familiar with the old code, you maybe have known about TDV, time dependent valuation of, of energy. But now under the 2022 code, there's a new metric called source energy. And it's essentially a proxy for the carbon emissions impact of that energy. So now how that energy is made really comes into play. And what and more than the time dependent valuation, it really comes into play on how it impacts the California energy grid. So now when you take a look at uh, Title 24 compliance, for example, on a non, um, for uh, projects, you're gonna be looking at three, three metrics now. It's gonna, has to be energy efficient. It's gonna say pass, if it meets the efficiency. And then it's gonna take into account solar energy, PVs. And if it meets a total efficiency, it's gonna say pass. And now it's gonna take into account the source energy for carbon, and it's gotta have a pass. And that's what the um, footnotes one, two, and three refer to. And again, you'll you'll get a copy of the slides and you know I'll stick around for questions. But also if you're new to the code and you're just learning and learning about it, or if some of this information is new to you, don't forget we have the code coach service. I mean that's that's one of the things we do is help everyone in the planning building departments uh, sort through some of this new stuff in the code. So that performance method does give you trade-offs. So Jennifer, we, sorry, yeah. we just got like five minutes left. Okay, so the trade-offs means you can, one thing does well, something else doesn't do well, you can trade them off. So we compare a standard design, a proposed design, and then we compare that compliance. And in this case, we uh, 
we're a little low on what we needed to do for compliance, but then we were better in other categories. So we're passing. And we do the same thing for efficiency, add the PVs, we're passing. In this case, this example, we put extra PVs in. And where that comes into a play now is on this source. So now we look at that compliance margin. We're still under in our space heating, but we did better in our other categories. But interestingly enough, on the efficiency, we're still not quite there on the source energy, but because we have those extra PVs more than was required, that's how we boosted our um, improvement on the carbon emissions. And kind of that history of California now where we're going is the PVs, the battery, the new requirement in 2022 for commercial projects is to say that you may have an energy efficient building, but if that energy efficient building still requires power plants that burn fossil fuels, it's not really helping with the overall carbon impact. So that's where those extra PV panels come into play. You can use that to offset that other impact. And so for some additional resources, um, California Energy Commission, uh, through their website, where you're gonna have find forms, trainings, videos. It's also where you're gonna get the link to that climate zone finder. If you don't know what climate zone you're dealing with, uh, there's also uh, an informational bulletin on each of these splash pages, just uh, reminding everyone that the HERS registry is not available for the multifamily projects yet, but it will be soon. And it also in this bulletin links you to a whole page that gives you access to all the documents. So you can take a look at all those um, manuals and um, regulations yourself. And another great resource is the blueprint. I love this, love this because it gives examples of what is maybe a clarification, or if there's a question that the California Energy Commission gets frequently, they'll put it in the blueprint to answer code questions. And then another uh, great resource is the California Code ACE. It's in addition to having a digital format of part six energy code it also includes the title 20 appliance standards and there's a lot of fact sheets and trigger sheets and checklists that are can be very useful for designers but also for codes officials and plans examiners um, and it seems like these ones folks will be able to go through on the slide deck so Cheers, CalCERT, oh, yep. uh, the next one, uh, HCD, and then finally, as you alluded to, the Code Coach. Uh, again, this is a free service. It's available for designers, builders, um, as well as code officials. And so you um, go onto the, the form, the Code Coach at 3CREN.org. Uh, Inbalance Green Consulting is proud to be a provider of the Code Coach service, and so it'll come um, to us and our uh, team of um, certified energy analysts. So whether it's a, a customer that's coming in that doesn't know what to do on a something, you can just refer them out. If you have a question, if there's a, a, a resource that is needed, it could be in the field. Uh, our team is here to help and it's completely free like all of these training classes. And with that, I think um, we want to make sure we're trying to capture, we know your time is precious and so that um, two to three, so we'll kind of finish up here. These are the upcoming classes. Be sure to register for each of the courses. Um, so if you did part one, it doesn't automatically register you for the rest of the series. And um, Sarah, if you have any other remarks, and then Jennifer and I are going to stay on the call uh, to be able to answer questions, or you can always just uh, reach out by email to that um, link, and we will uh, respond as best we can. Sarah. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to launch a poll really quick. It's just for really short questions just to help us gauge, um, you know, the the usefulness or, you know, just the, the knowledge of this uh, course. Like Andy said, this is the first in the six part series. So all the other courses you'll want to sign up for and you, the links will be in the slides themselves. Um, and there's learning units, AIA and ICC. So feel free to send me an email if you need to provide your number. Um, and the slides and the recording will be sent to your inbox in the next day or so. Uh, so with that, I think we can open it up for questions. Um, if you don't have any questions, feel free to drop off. I know that it's three o'clock right now. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Great. Jennifer, you want to stop sharing and we can see if there's any discussion. Yeah, and feel free to unmute if there's a question. I know there was some uh, discussion about the um, kind of that uh, the fuel switching that's going on. Uh, Jennifer uh, alluded to the um, changing in the fuel um, and what the the bigger California goals. I think it's it is an interesting uh, position that we're kind of straddling in terms of that resiliency piece that. Um, I, I know a lot of folks like, gosh, if the power, if the electric grid goes out, then do we still have gas? Um, and of course, modern appliances are still electric start. So you may not have those gas appliances in the first place. And I think a lot of the conversations we're having about resiliency is that kind of microgrid type of approach where you have um, solar panels and batteries and the batteries are, you know, sized to be able to um, meet your most critical loads, whether it's a residential or non-residential. Um, so I, th I think those are some of the, the key points that we're seeing as well as the cost savings and just the transition. That's a lot of what 3C REN and the CPUC, the um, Public Utilities Commission were focused on easing that transition. So a lot of incentive programs to provide uh, rebates um, on uh, specific electrification or even just energy efficient appliances if you're switching water heaters or uh, heating cooling systems. Um, there's a lot of uh, other incentives for electric vehicles, uh, panel, electrical panel upgrades, all those types of things. So I, I think we it, it's a reality for sure in terms of the the transition that we're in right now as we straddle the the outgoing. Um, and then the other side of it is just that we're seeing the the natural the natural gas, the methane is there's more leakage than we realized. So it's contributing and methane is much worse in terms of global warming potential, more impactful. so um, so that even just the gas infrastructure, is super impactful. And then the health implications of that we're seeing from um, com uh, combustion cooktops, that there's a, a lot of um, unhealthy consequences. So uh, a, a whole bunch of reasons why the switch to electrification, I think, is is bumpy, but uh, a, a sure, sure to be going forward. Right. I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on that. What is that? Um carbon proxy the new metric that's come into the energy code is um, not everyone's aware that in california uh if our solar and our wind can't it isn't meeting um it can't meet all the needs at the nighttime for example maybe wind energy comes in hydro energy comes in to feed the whole grid but solar when the sun goes down we don't have solar so the state has implemented a lot of battery storage to kind of pull that solar energy use through. But California also runs gas powered, natural gas powered peaker plants. So even if you had a very energy efficient building, if that energy efficient building depended on energy that is being um, delivered at night and before the sun comes up the next day, that energy is really coming from a gas powered peaker plant and not from solar or wind. 
And so that's where that carbon proxy comes into play, because even an energy efficient builder, uh, energy efficient building could cause these gas power plants to need to operate. So you get that extra credit if you have the extra PVs and the extra battery on site. And that's how you can offset that, that carbon proxy, that, um, that next metric. So um, that's also how you get the affordability, right? So some of the comments are just, you know, absolutely that there's a, a concerns about affordability, equity, who's getting the benefits, you know, who owns homes, who's getting these incentives, et cetera. Um, but that the change in the um, net energy metering, the NEM 2.0 that has um, expired and the NEM 3.0, which, you know, is still cost effective with batteries um, because then you're shaving peak load. There's actually a super clever, I, I think it's a clever system, um, and we've talked about it conceptually for a long time about um, charging, um, heating hot water for in your water tank for um, in the middle of the day. Uh, and so you're kind of shaving that peak load, but using the hot water as kind of a, a thermal energy storage so that you have hot water later. And now there's a um, some companies that are using that hot water for heating as well as um, just for taking a shower or whatever. So it's an interesting strategy to try to align energy use with that middle of the day um, solar energy availability um, as we are bringing more wind online and, and other things. Um, and feel free to unmute if somebody wants to, I see some kind of longer questions or comments um, in the chat, but you're welcome to um, unmute um, either Alexis or Joshua if you want to make a comment. All right, so let's read well, Alexis. Yeah, this so is one question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, are there any benefits of choosing to go the prescriptive route over the performance route? Or is the only real difference that if you strike out on your recipe card that you can use a computer program to do the calculations for you to determine whether you'll pass fail the energy standards regardless? Great question. Um, when it comes, probably, uh, yeah, go ahead, I'll Jennifer. Just jump in. <laughs> yeah, we're we're finding when it comes to the residential code. Uh, it seems like it's pretty straightforward to go with the computer model. That seems to fit the biggest variety of combination that people want for their home, the architect's design or the developer is doing for their particular uh, multifamily project. So, so far, even the multifamily, single family, the performance method seems to be uh, better, easier. Now, on, com on the non-res projects, I'd say it's kind of a toss-up. It's 50-50. Sometimes the equipment you're going to use will, is going to comply anyway. The lighting system you're going to use is going to comply. You're going to do a code-efficient lighting system. So you're just going through that checklist. And then the last piece is is the envelope meeting this checklist recipe? And a lot of times, since it is being used as the baseline, um, there's a push to get the architectural design team to just design it to the code baseline anyway. Like, don't expect your mechanical engineer and your lighting engineer to make up for a poor envelope because more and more it becomes cost uh, prohibitive sometimes to go with that high efficiency in mechanical systems to make up for a poor envelope. And we're just kind of seeing that within the teams are like, hey, architect, kind of do your <laughs> part of, it, of making this whole building energy efficiency, energy efficient. So then we see it's a toss up. Like sometimes that's just easy to do prescriptive and then sometimes it's easy to do a model. And I mean, the modeling is not um, flawless, right? Sometimes the model doesn't necessarily reflect what you, how you think something should be performing. So if you can meet prescriptively, it's certainly, it's certainly uh, uh, simpler. 
Yeah, and then we have a comment about the, all the folks, right, trying to get their uh, solar panels. Right, that's what we're just saying. That queue, right under mm -hmm. NEM two before it goes to NEM three. Yeah, I'm sure you guys saw a big influx on on that. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Any any other questions or comments? Otherwise, we'll call it a wrap and see you all next time. I posted um, a question. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, if an existing office building already uh, it's already exists and is converted to use as a church, what parts of the code are relevant to prioritized pre-design discussion? Okay, what you want to do there, um, and you know, totally, you can put this in a code coach, and then either I or Grant or actually be the one to work with you, and we could kind of help you go through it. But the super quick answer is that you're going to follow the portions of the code that are for the occupancy you're moving towards. So you're going to be looking at um, those the non-residential part of the code, and it's applicable to whether it's a church or office, you know, it's non-residential. Assembly or, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, there's just a whole section on additions and alterations, and it's nuanced. It will totally depend on what you think you want to change. It's... Right, what triggers... That, that would be a good question in the code coach. I'm serious. We could help you with that one. <laughs> Right. Good plug. I have a quick question. Oh, nice cat. <laughs> <laughs> this is other cat. <laughs> this is the um, are there any, I'm in LA, but I'm moving up to Cambria and we have a, I just inherited a house and like, it's an energy hog, really bad, like 1984 appliances type stuff with like rusted refrigerator plates and it's bad. So I'm, I'm, I'm chipping away at it, but are there, are there, are there any incentivized programs to help people like make their existing properties? Cause people are spending stupid amounts of money and then they're installing a lot of solar panels to compensate. And it just seems so absurd to me. And, and this may just be out of the realm of this, of this group, but I'm wondering if you're hearing any murmurings of any efforts being made in that direction. Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> I know, we're queuing up Sarah. <laughs> um, yeah, so 3C Run has a contractor incentive program that's for residents. Um, I can get you in touch with the uh, program manager for our uh, specific program. We also have a contractor directory on our website. Um, there's also other uh, incentives available throughout the state that can be stacked with that program. Um, so I can follow up with you uh, and get you that information. Yeah, that would be great because there's a bunch of folks up that I know up there that could use a help. <laughs> they're they're dumping money into their into their in their power bills for no good reason, and there's some of the stuff is, you know, just change all your light bulbs to LED kind of stuff. It's not that not that hard or that hard to, to do it. Right. There, it's interesting also in our area is that um, there's a community choice energy, Central Coast Community Energy. And so every city in the county of San Luis Obispo is already enrolled. Um, <laughs> and then um, the county, so which, you know, Cambria, Cayucos are unincorporated. Um, and so um, though they're not currently enrolled yet and won't be, for, I mean, they've just decided to. And so I don't think that they actually get into it until like, until 2024, or even 2025, um, which is unfortunate because that um, Central Coast Community Energy has other incentives, but only for, you know, residents of under that um, program. So county was just late to join. I got you. I just, you know, I'll, I'll try and evangelize wherever I can because it's important that we do this, you know, as fast and as hard as we can. So thank you. This Absolutely. has been a lovely, you've done a wonderful job presenting this. I appreciate it. Oh, great. Thanks. Hope to see you on the other ones.
Yeah. Welcome. Uh, um, I think we have we do have to close it up now. Yeah. Okay. I apologize if that's one too many questions. That's fine. Thank you so much for the training. Oh, yeah. if you if you have more questions, then contact uh, Sarah or put it through the Code Coach. Um, okay. Thank you. And awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll thanks everyone. Help. See you next time. Okay. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.